Thank you so very much for coming out today. Uh, we've all made it through uh, a wicked wet 2023, and unfortunately, it looks like 2024 is not marginally better so, uh, so far. So we thought about doing this um, as part of our uh, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Plan 2.0. The town of Deerfield has been cutting edge on most of the climate resiliency just because as being at the bottom of the bowl, we don't have much choice. So we were the first in the state MVP certified, the first in the state with a healthy soils plan, and we hope to be first in the state for MVP 2.0. And what 2.0 really is, is reaching out in the community and helping our community members be more resilient. And after the devastation of the July storms this summer, both from the town level and all the crops, it just, it, it makes sense that we work together to try to figure out a ways forward in dealing with the new climate change um, impacts that we're just seeing much faster than I think people anticipated. So um, we're gonna get going because there's a lot of interesting things happening. And um, so, Tim Hilchey, my select board member. I'm Carolyn Ness, uh, select board member and board of health. And Tim Hilchey uh, is also a select board, board of health. And we both are on the MVP committee. And I just want to recognize some of the other uh, MVP members that are here today. H Henry Melnick, wiggle your hand there, Henry. Um, I know MA's right there in the front. Um, Pete Law is right there from the Conservation Commission. Um, and Chris Curtis and Wayne are here as our facilitators for, that work with us under the grant program. So good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Mark Stinson. I've been with MassDEP for 17 years now. Uh, I'm the circuit writer, which my technical job is to provide technical and regulatory assistance to the 106 conservation commissions in the DEP Western region, which composes the four western counties as well as five towns in Worcester County. Uh, I love my job, I love the outreach, I love helping commissions out. I also provide assistance to anyone that gives me a call, shoots me an email. Uh, so this is like my fourth or fifth presentation about, an ag about agriculture and the Wetlands Protection Act. It's actually, uh, the definition of agriculture in the, in the regulations is the longest definition and I'll tell you, it's the, pretty much the hardest to understand. Oh, I'd also like to introduce my, uh, my section chief, Mike McHugh. Mike's been with DEP for longer than I have. Uh, and I also want to thank the town, uh, Peter, the chair of the commission, the police chief, uh, Carolyn, and everyone else. Uh, DPW workers all did an outstanding job bringing the town back into shape. It, it was actually a real pleasure working with uh, the various people in town hall. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about basically is I, I saw what was on the on the handout and you know how do, what do you do with drainage ditches, but I'm going to encompass pretty much everything, which is you know farming in the Wetlands Protection Act. So Deerfield has kind of been the epicenter of storm events over the last. Oh, well, since Irene. I spent a lot of time in Deerfield right after I, uh, Tropical Storm, Tropical, whatever it was, hit Deerfield, Greenfield, and then uh, this past summer. So in a way, this past summer was worse than Irene because it hit a much larger area of town. So back in Irene, it was basically the farms along the river that got hit. But this was, you know, town-wide. You know, you guys, Ashfield, Conway, uh, you, I think you took the biggest brunt this summer. So, you know, our job was to provide all the outreach we can to assist you. So the commission did a great job. Peter called me. You know, we went over emergency stuff. And under the regulations, uh, the weather protection regulations, uh, the commission can issue an emergency permit for 30 days. After that, uh, any request to extend the emergency permit has to come to us, DEP, and then we issued it. So Mike McHugh spent, my supervisor, 
Uh, he spent a lot of time talking with everybody in town, doing a great job, making sure the infrastructure especially was getting restored. Uh, so my contact information is right there, cell, uh, cell phone, and I mean all DEP staff now have cell phones, no direct office number, and emails. So anybody can email me, anybody can call me. So don't hesitate if you have a question. So the right of agriculture is, is right in the Constitution. It says the people should have the right to uh, the utilization of the agricultural, mineral, forest, water, air, and other natural resources is hereby declared to be a public purpose. So on the one hand, you have agriculture. Farmers are the mo one of the most important groups in this country to take care of people. And then you have the wetlands, which have, you know, act as a sponge, act as, as a natural resource to protect everything that happens in the environment. So what they came up with was when they wrote the regulations, they, they had to balance agriculture with the, with the wetlands. And they actually came up with guidance on all this. The group that was brought together was regulators, farmers, legislators, to work out all the language to make sure farmers were protected at the same time protecting resource areas. So I don't have to tell farmers, you know, what their normal maintenance, normal improvement are, is you guys know that. Uh, typically the only time DEP or Conservation Commission will get involved with the farmer is when we get complaints and the typical complaint might be uh, manure. <laughs> and for the most part that's not, a, that's not a wetland issue, it's a Board of Health issue. So the Board of Health has broad discretionary power. But farmers know what Farmers know the right thing to do. We don't need to get involved. Uh, it's only when they want to expand the farm, put up farm buildings, or, or things like that, that things might need to be permitted. So that's what, kind of what we're going to get into. So uh, again, this is the, the largest definition in, in the wetland regulations. Uh, there are statutory. Statutory means state law. So, we have the Wetlands Protection Act, which is Chapter 131, Section 40. Then we have the regulations to implement, implement the Act, which is 310 CMR 10. So you have the basics in the law, and then it's fully explained, or I shouldn't say fully, it's further explained in, in the regulations. So the most important criteria is what is land and agricultural use? And then what's normal maintenance? And there's 17 categories. Then what's normal improvement? There's nine categories. And common misuses of the exemption and then additional resources. This is, this is the first paragraph of the act itself where it says no person shall remove, fill, dredge, or alter a resource area without basically filing a notice of intent getting an order of conditions. Key word here is no person. We do not take enforcement action against cattle. We do not take enforcement action against beavers. We can't. So what we would regulate would be the placement, potentially regulate, would be the placement of a fence, placement of a barn, things like that, because that is something that a person does. But if a, a cow, uh, any cow or horse walk through a stream, you know, does it look bad? Potentially, yes but it's not something we regulate because the stream would be land and agricultural use. So if you look at the slide on the right, where you see the cattle getting ready to cross the stream, you see a fenced off area with a bunch of trees growing, which could be fruit trees, things like that. So the barn is land and agricultural use. The stream where the cattle are crossing is land and agricultural use. The path is land and agricultural use. The question is, is the fenced in area land and agricultural use? So just because you have land on farm property does not necessarily make it land and agricultural use. If the trees were fruit trees and there was a farm stand and the fruit would produce apples, pears, peaches, whatever, and they were then sold in, on the farm stand, then yes, that would be land and agricultural use. But if the trees were just for personal use, then no, 
the, that area would not be considered land and agricultural use. It's not pasture. The, the cattle can't get in there. So the, main, the point I'm trying to make is it's not the land that is exempt. It's the activity. So the activity uh, on both those areas is growing a commodity for a commercial purpose. You're growing cattle for milk, for meat. Uh, you put farm equipment in the barn. You have to be really careful when you, the important thing is what is an land and agricultural use. The provisions of this section shall not apply, meaning the act, the regulations do not apply to work performed for normal maintenance or improvement of land and agricultural use. So again, it's the activity that would not apply, not the land. So there was a, a farmland advisory board. They, they spent a lot of time putting things together to make it right. Is it perfect? No. It's the best everybody could do. So the best is pretty good. So just here's different ideas of agriculture. E even uh, beekeeping, that's uh, selling the honey. That's land and agricultural use. So the first thing, so you got a chicken coop. Is that land and agricultural use? And the, the question I would have is, are the chickens or the eggs being sold for a commercial purpose? Commercial purpose basically making a profit. Let me give you an example. You drive around Western Mass up in Heath, uh, Leiden, up that way during the summer, and you see blueberry stands. That's not land and agriculture, or the farm stand is never land and agricultural use, and I'll explain that if anybody has any questions. But selling the blueberry, or the blueberry patches are not necessarily land and agricultural use because it's, the intent there is not for a commercial purpose. So we want to separate what's a real farmer versus a part-time, let's say, or a hobby farmer. So again, let's look at horses. Somebody has, and this is quite common, uh, somebody has a couple horses they have for a riding stable. That's not agriculture because selling uh, somebody riding a horse or training is not, oh, yeah, Beckett. Uh, is not land and agricultural use. So again, you got to separate what's what's commercial for a commercial purpose versus just a hobby. So and then we go into is it normal maintenance, and then is it normal improvement. So again, you saw in one of the slides where you have uh, everything characterized. 17, I think, normal maintenance, and then uh, nine normal improvement. Not everything is included. So if there's ever a question, is it normal maintenance, is it land and agricultural use, is it normal improvement, our general guidance is a request for determination of applicability should be submitted to the Conservation Commission. And that way there's absolutely no question, is it, is it agriculture or is it something not agriculture? So occasionally, and I, there's a recurrent case that Peter and I have talked about, the chair of the commission, uh, about a, a barn and a porch. And, and I can talk later. I don't want to get into it now. So, uh, so that certain things might be, might be uh, need to get permitted. Other things wouldn't be. One is clearly normal maintenance or normal improvement of land and agricultural use. So here's the definition. Land and agricultural use means land within resource areas or their buffer zone. So it encompasses, you know, uh, wetlands. So I've seen farmers uh, putting corn, hay in wetlands, but it's been farmed like that for 50 years, so it's not an issue. So even though you're plowing wetlands, it's legally allowed as an, as an exempt activity, agricultural exempt activity. You can't do it for new agriculture, but you can do it for existing agriculture. And so let me give you an example. You drive by cornfields, and you see in the middle of the, uh, the field, the corn stalks are eight foot high. And then along the edges where you see it's very wet, the corn stalks might be only a foot or two. That's wet, you know, uh, likely a wetland 
but it's not, it's not a legal, it's still a legal wetland, but the activity of planting there is still an exempt activity. Uh, so then you get into raising one or more of the following agricultural commodities for a commercial purpose. Animals, uh, fruit trees, maple syrup, other foods for human consumption, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also get into forest products on land maintained and forest use. So that's clear. So you have land in production. And then you also have land that is not in production but is still considered land and agricultural use. So for example, a farm road, the barn, uh, a livestock crossing, that's considered land and agricultural use even though it's not land in production. Uh, so the agricultural exemption is a five year. So let's say a farm is sold and it's going to be used for a subdivision. God help us all. Uh, I don't like losing farms to things like that. It can lie fallow for five years, and then let's say the subdivision falls through, but in year six, a farmer wants to start up again. The exemption's gone. So you basically have to treat it all as new agriculture, even though it might have been farmed there for 50 to 100 years. So I would always recommend either, either get into the agricultural conservation program where you're paid to let land lie fallow, or at least once every five years, plant a crop that you're going to sell for a commercial purpose so you don't lose the agricultural exemption for land and agricultural use. So here we get into normal maintenance of land and agricultural use. I wish I had more pictures. But the problem is agriculture, you guys all know agriculture, pictures aren't going to help, but words matter in this case because each word matters. So normal maintenance of land and agricultural use does not include placing substantial amounts of fill in, in floodplain, <clears throat> watering land subject to flooding. There is no definition for substantial. Uh, but everybody, I think, the commissions in DEP, you know it when you see it, uh, one of those kind of things. Or filling, a salt mar filling or dredging a salt marsh, and right now we don't have any salt marshes in Western Mass, thank goodness means the following activities without enlargement or geographical extent that are, this is important right here, that are occurring in land and agriculture use when directly related to production or raising of the product, when undertaken in such a manner as to prevent erosion and siltation of adjacent water bodies and wetlands. What that means is you can conduct an agricultural exempt activity on your property but if you cause a huge sediment bloom in the nearby stream, or a big slug of sediment to end up in the wetlands, your agricultural exempt activity caused a violation, and you can be held accountable for that. So all we're saying is use best management practices. You don't want to lose your soil, period. So all crop management practices not to include drainage in a bordering vegetative wetland. So there's caveats before you get into the specific normal maintenance exemptions, there are caveats to it as to where it applies. Fertilizers, manures, compost materials, existing access roads. So if you have a farm crossing, which most farms in Deerfield have some type of wetland or stream crossing, and you need to replace an existing culvert, that's going to be an exempt activity. However, if you have a if you want to put in a new crossing, a new bridge, or a new culvert, that would require permitting because it's not existing. So you're allowed to do normal maintenance of existing, basically existing agricultural infrastructure. Management of existing field edges, uh, limited to within 100 feet from the land of production. Maintain your fences, management of temporary fence, fence lines. So you can even go into a stream. So the seven is the clearing, cleaning, grading, repairing, dredging, or maintenance, or restoring of existing man-made or natural water management systems. Farm ponds. So uh, I've run across this. A uh, farmer has a farm pond. So what constitutes a farm pond? It's not a pond that exists on a farm. So a farm pond would be a, a, a in order to be considered land and agricultural use, animals would have to drink from it, or 
you would have to be withdrawing water from it to irrigate your crops. So again, is it a, is it a farm pond or is it just a pond that exists on a farm? So if it's a, if it's a agricultural pond where the, let's say the cows or horses drink from it, you can go in there and dredge it, clean it out, restore it, and not need a permit from the Conservation Commission. Uh, so that's why it's so important to first determine what is land and agricultural use. Uh, and then you get into grass waterways, dikes, subsurface drainage systems. So uh, the maintenance and repair of ongoing agricultural composting sites provided that such storage only occurs in the buffer zone or bordering land subject to flooding, meaning you cannot have a new composting site in wetlands or, the, or, or a stream or a bank. Uh, maintenance and repair of existing farm structures, uh, maintain the flow of existing natural waterways. So this is a subsurface drainage system. So you guys know better than I ever will whether or not you have tile drains, whether or not you need to drain your fields to keep them relatively dry, the growing area kept dry, and whether or not they need to be drained. So you're allowed, if it's existing, you're allowed to maintain it. This is what I want to talk about. Is this stream land and agricultural use? And the answer is, it's a natural body of water flowing between two agricultural fields. And the question is, just looking at the picture, I have no idea. So I don't see any animals that would be, that I don't see any path down to the stream where animals would be drinking. I don't see any water withdrawal. So then the third criteria is basically, is the groundwater high or the soils poor such that the stream is needed for drainage of the fields? So let's, hypothetically, there's no animals here, there's no water withdrawal. The question is, is this just a stream that goes through a field or is it land and agricultural use? So if there's tile drains, if you have poor soil and you need that runoff, you need that channel in order to help drain the fields for your crops, then yes, that, I would call that stream land and agricultural use because it's needed for you to keep your fields dry enough to grow crops. If you have good soils there, very good drainage, there's no tile drains, there's no animals, then I would call it and say, well, I would, in my opinion, based on that, I would say no, it's not land and agricultural use. So if it was land and agricultural use, you're allowed to go in and basically dredge that to restore the flow that existed that you need to keep the fields dry. If it's not land and agricultural use, then if you wanted to dredge it, you'd actually have to file a notice of intent and get permission from the Conservation Commission. So again, going back, you must understand what is and what is not land and agricultural use. This is, but for the most part, you guys know, the farmers know, you know your soils, you know what you need, you know what your, your fields, how wet they get, whatever, it's been wet this summer, we all know that. Uh, so if you go to the commission and say, if you want an opinion, you go to the commission, you know, give them the information they'll need and, and they'll tell you, well, it sounds like it is or it sounds like it isn't. But if you want a legal answer, you'd have to file a request for determination. So verbal response from DEP or from a conservation commission is an opinion. It's not legally binding. If you want a legally binding answer, you would submit what's called a request for determination to the, to the commission and DEP. They'd give you a legal answer. If you don't like the answer, it's an appealable document to DEP, then it would be our case. Uh, we typically don't get uh, many appeals on agricultural issues because for the most part, farmers don't get into trouble. They, they know what they're doing. So then we get into normal improvement. So no, you guys know what normal maintenance is, there's a list. Then we get into normal improvement of land and agricultural use. How are you going to improve the agricultural fields? How are you going to improve your farm? So it gets into installation of permanent fencing. This is another one 
that you need to read the, the under section uh, item C there in parenthesis where things are good. So, which in all cases does not include filling or dredging of salt marsh, includes the following activity when they occur on land and agricultural use. So, the typical exemption applies specifically to land and agricultural use. But here it's saying, or when they occur within the buffer zone or bordering land subject to flooding that is not land and agricultural use. So we've got five resource areas. We've got land underwater. We've got the bank, bank of a stream, bank of a pond. We've got bordering vegetated wetlands. We've got land subject to flooding and riverfront area. Uh, which, by the way, new agricultural activities. So if somebody wants to expand their, their farmland or somebody wants to create a new farm for new agriculture, so a new farm, only typically we have the 200-foot riverfront area. The entirety of it is a, is a resource area. You turn over a shovel in the riverfront, cut a tree down in the riverfront, it needs permitting. But for new agriculture, you only have a 100-foot. So the legislature, when they wrote the law, gave farmers that additional 100 feet to do with as agriculture without having to file. You go inside the 100 foot, you got to file. Uh, so when they occur on land and agriculture, you use when they occur in the buffer zone. So if you wanted to do new, if you wanted to do improvement on bank, land underwater, the zero to 100 riverfront, uh, it would not be exempt. It would not be included in this uh, normal improvement. So again, that's why it's so careful. You gotta, you gotta read everything. Uh, farm structures. So uh, a farmer is allowed to put up a 4,000 foot structure on land and agricultural use or in the buffer zone or in the floodplain is, a normal, is, a, is an exempt activity, normal improvement. It says right there, include, not including habitable dwellings. So a farmhouse is never land and agricultural use. So provided the footprint of the structure does not exceed 4,000 square feet, no filling of the floodplain occurs beyond the footprint of the building. So if you wanted to build a, a 3,900, 4,000 square foot barn in the floodplain, you can do it. <coughs> as long as it doesn't exceed 4,000 square feet, and you are allowed to raise up the land underneath the structure, just not outside the structure, as an exempt activity, as normal improvement. You're allowed to square off field edges, but not if it's in a wetland, and you're not increasing the land in production, and no fill is placed within land subject to flooding and then bypass canals, channels, and tailwater recovery systems. I don't think I've ever seen anyone out here have a tailwater recovery system. Basically what it is is just to treat your runoff before it goes into a resource area or it gets out of your field. A change in commodity. So you can go from having cattle to planting corn as a change in commodity. However, if anyone has uh, maple trees getting sap production and you want to change it to another commodity that's not exempt. Common misunderstandings. So you cannot drain wetlands to create new farmland, land in production. You cannot clear cut uh, riparian meaning riverfront areas and floodplains without a forest cutting permit which is under DCR uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation, the service forester. So you can have, you can easily have a land in production growing corn and then you have to back 50 for forestry. I see that quite often. So you're allowed to do that. But if you want to clear cut riverfront or floodplain to increase land in production, you've got to file a notice of intent. So forestry, DCR, when it issues a forest cutting permit, can only issue forest cutting permits for forestry management. If the intent is to clear cut to increase land and production, DCR Forestry cannot issue 
a forest cutting permit because it's not forestry management. It's going to convert to, to farmland or potentially single family houses. Uh, so you can't do that. Uh, if you have a stream going through your field and you want to increase land and production, let's say, to get the stream on, uh, below grade, you can't do it uh, without the filing of a notice of intent and complying with the wetland regulations. So you cannot add culverts where there has not been a culvert before. Uh, you can't straighten natural stream channels. You can, you can clean them in their existing configuration if it's land and agricultural use, but you just can't go in there and straighten them out. Uh, one of the things that happened during Irene was creating soil berms. Uh, you know, there was a lot of sediment came up on the fields along the river, uh, and some of the farms in the area around in Western Mass put berms up to prevent the floodwaters, and that is a violation. That's not normal improvement. That's not normal maintenance of land and agricultural use. Here's our here's helpful resources. Uh, we actually have the manual that's 90% accurate. Uh, EPA has guidance, uh, USDA, NRCS has guidance, a lot of guidance. This is an example of a stream that is land and agricultural use. So this is in Goshen. This farmer has a bunch of cattle. They routinely drink from the stream and therefore that stream would be considered land and, agri land and agricultural use. Uh, the fence was put, so we would not regulate, the, regardless, we would not regulate the cattle drinking from the stream. Uh, if, let's say there was a house downstream and the cattle were pooping and peeing in the stream and it was affecting a downstream homeowner's shallow well, we would refer it to the Board of Health because, it's, because what, the, what the farmer is doing or that the, cow, the cattle are doing is an exempt activity. It would be a Board of Health issue, not a DEP issue. But we want to work with people, so that's the guidance we, we give the complainant. And we do get complaints like that sometimes, but typically not for cow or cattle. It would be typically for a, for a hobby horse person. And here you can see the aerial photographs. You can see the area is pretty wet. You can see the stream channel. So again, the, the, the uh, pasture, uh, the stream, all that would be considered land and agricultural use. So then we have agricultural emergencies. So agricultural emergencies are looked at slightly differently because there's actually a specific section for agricultural emergencies, and it typically deals with major storm events. So if you, can, if you have a major storm event and you need to conduct normal maintenance, you're all set. Uh, but if you need to do over and above what's considered normal maintenance, you need to review this section. So eliminate an imminent threat to land and agricultural use. Uh, restore land and agricultural use that has been damaged due to a storm or other sudden unforeseen event. So if you come to the commission and talk to them about uh, a storm, you have an issue now from a storm that happened in July, well, it, it may not work because it's been, what, six months later. Uh, so it's supposed to be other sudden unforeseen event. Uh, creating a new water source. Uh, we haven't had any issues with Asian longhorn beetles not since, what, 2014, 2015, when the issue really came up around between Worcester, around Worcester County and around Boston. The issue here is, or I shouldn't say the issue, the main, the main requirement is if you do something under the agricultural emergency section, you must notify DEP and the Conservation Commission within three days after the work is commenced or within three days after the end of the emergency event, whichever is greater. Guess what? In 17 years of being here in the Western region, I've never seen this happen. Not saying it shouldn't have happened, but I've never seen it happen. 
Again, we're not going out to farms and looking for violations. That's not what we do. In fact, I think DEP would be extremely happy if we never even had to take enforcement action because everyone was doing things right. Occasionally, we have to. Must commence within 30 days following a storm event. Now, the issue, what's happened, we have an issue like this in Conway and a few other towns. No work under the emergency section will be allowed. So you have the agricultural emergencies, uh, slope stabilization, farm fields going into the stream. They want to rip wrap the heck out of it, but it's rare species habitat, can't do it. You cannot do it under an emergency, so it must be done through the regular permitting process. So we're not saying nothing you want to do can't be done. We're just saying you can't use normal maintenance can't use normal improvement, you can't use the agricultural emergencies, you need a wetlands consultant basically to advise you on the permitting process if it's in rare species habitat. So one of the great things about mass.gov is we've got some excellent <coughs> geographic information, system information uh, online. You have Mass Mapper, where you can pull up basically the same information I can with my fancy dandy uh, computer program and Natural Heritage also has good mapping system on their website that shows you where the rare species are located in a general area. Not saying the, the rare species is gonna be in that specific footprint, but they never highlight the specific footprint where a rare species is located. They basically do the parcel. So along the Connecticut, you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of rare species not everywhere, certain locations. Uh, so again, if you're, uh, if, uh, you're a farmer, homeowner, whoever you are, if you want to learn where endangered species, rare species are on in the area, just go to the Natural Heritage website. It's really easy to find, really easy to use. So this is a site out in Berkshire County. Is this an agricultural emergency? Uh, the slide on the left is from 1997. The slide on the right is for uh, 2019, I think. I've been to this site multiple times. It's a cornfield uh, in southern Berkshire County. And the river over time, not even, with, not even from storm events, you can see what it's done. It's intruding into the land in production. So it's not an emergency because it's not due to a sudden storm event. The river, Mother Nature always wins. No matter what people do, Mother Nature always wins. So what ha has happened is the river has changed course. Uh, it's intruding into the field, but on top of this, it's also in rare, sh rare species habitat. So the farmer did not want to spend the money to go through the regular permitting process He's lost his field, but he still has plenty of field left. Uh, so it is what it is. I'm just saying, one, is it land and agricultural use? Yes, it's cornfields. Two, is it an emergency? No, because this happens slowly over time, over a period of 15, 20 years. And then three, it's also in rare species habitat, so no exemption, agricultural emergency exemption can apply. So this is actually pretty common in the region, you know, you've got a lot of glacial soils and the rivers want to move around when you have broad floodplain coming off, the river's going to do what it wants to do. You know, uh, Waitley, if you remember the wastewater, I think the wastewater treatment plant was uh, having problems and they needed to reroute some of the stream because the river was doing something like this. Deerfield, you know, the Deerfield River is has these meanders, oxbows. The Connecticut River has oxbows. <clears throat> so I got this from the USDA uh, website. And again, USDA NRCS has a lot of wonderful material. One thing I would love to see would be more riparian buffers. So you'll see in the northern part of the slide, the upper part of the slide, you'll see a very large riparian buffer and there's been no stream alteration. And then, where the farmer has been mowing right up to the edge of the stream, you'll see there's no deep, good deep root structure, so there's nothing really holding this, the river back 
from doing what it wants to do. So in my opinion, so sometimes farmers can, in a way, by wanting to maximize their land in production, they're actually having a negative impact on their own infrastructure. I'm not gonna tell you you can't do it because the regulations, if it's land and agricultural use, you can do anything you want. But I'd love to see more farmers take advantage of, uh, of increasing uh, a vegetative buffer adjacent to a stream in order to reduce the likelihood of a stream changing its course and you guys losing your, your uh, land and production. So farming and solar. So our policy at DEP is if you want to put, I mean, a lot of farms, they put solar panels on the barn. You see it everywhere. If you want to put it in the field, you can do it as an exempt activity, but only if the, the electricity is used by the farm. If you're putting, uh, you know, farming and agriculture, uh, farming and solar, agriculture and solar is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, but if you're putting electricity back into the grid, it's not exempt. And if you're in a resource area, the buffer zone, it's, it's, you gotta file. It's not an exempt activity. So Northfield has done a bunch of sites like this. Uh, there's been a few in Hadley. I'm not aware of anything in Deerfield at this time. So just be aware, if the electricity is gonna stay to be used by the farm, we're gonna consider it exempt. It goes into the grid, it's not exempt. You need to file if it's in our, our wetlands jurisdiction. That picture's in here. Is it? Okay, good to know. Where? In, where? UMass. Oh, the UMass, that's Are right. Exempt? No, UMass is not exempt. But if there's no wetlands nearby, they wouldn't have had to file. <clears throat> so, I have a question about that. Supposing that energy is used by the farm, but there's more than enough, and the overflow goes into the grid. Goes onto the grid, you got to file. Oh, so. What if you graze underneath them? Say again? What if you're grazing underneath them? You well, you're not, we're not looking at the grazing, we're looking at the construction of the panels and the poles. So that, that's what typically happens. So my experience up in Northfield and Hadley, they're either having, under the panels, they're either having grazing or they're having the panels up higher so you can get equipment under it. I mean, and, and it's up to the farmer to decide what they're gonna do. It, it, I don't care. All I care about is the wetlands, the, the, the requirement to file under the Wetlands Protection Act. So if you wanna graze, I don't care. If you wanna, uh, it's just gonna be expensive if you bring the panels up 10 foot high or so, you know? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Does that also include placing solar panels in a floodplain? Would DEP have jurisdiction over that? Well, is it land and agricultural use? If it was. If it was land and agricultural use, you put panels in the floodplain, and uh, uh, it's going into the grid, then yes, it absolutely has to file. Um, moving on to the next part of our program is um, Rita Thibodeau and Catherine McGee from the Natural Resource and Conservation Service. I first met Rita in 2005 when Mill Village Road was falling into the Deerfield River and no one came. Uh, no one was helping us. Mayor Forgey and Greenfield and I were beating on the state and no one came, but Rita came. She was our conservation district person uh, out of Franklin and uh, NRCS saved us. We worked through the Emergency Watershed Protection Program and, and restored Mill Village along um, Deerfield River uh, through grant program. And I had screwed up because I allowed dumping of rock, uh, which was a violation of the Army Corps engineers and I, I just wasn't aware. And it was my first event. And Rita and NRCS uh, came to the rescue. And I have to say, I have been a big fan ever since. I am chair of the conservation district in Franklin County. Um, I skip Yaswinski is here as another uh, supervisor on the conservation district. He's our treasurer as well. And he, we have with us um, Megan, who is our admin assistant, uh, part-time, very part-time. But we are available as a resource for you. 
and I will turn it over to Rita and Catherine so they can tell you all the programs. They're just fantastic. And they are, again, a huge resource as far as permitting and all your questions. And, and one of the things that is really critical here is we've worked over the years on the state level to um, uh, make sure that we have regional equity in the farm bills that come forward. So we have a baseline of money coming in, but we have $9 million extra this year, and it's gonna go for the next few years. Additional extra money, most of that money can stay in the valley, and please take the opportunity to um, look at these programs and see if they fit. This is a generational opportunity for us to have money to fix some of these problems that we have. So I'm turning it over to Rita to explain that. Hi everyone, I'm Rita Thibodeau. I am the Assistant State Conservationist for Programs with the United States Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Prior to that, many of you probably worked with me and know me. I was a district conservationist in Western Mass for 20 years. And so I worked directly with the farmers you know, on the land. Um, and so today, Catherine and I, Catherine McGee is our state resource conservationist. And we're gonna to talk to you a little bit about the programs that NRCS offers. And then we're gonna give you the side of the wetlands um, regulations that as USDA, we look at in conjunction with what DEP looks at um, from the state regulatory side. So the United States Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service services every county in the United States, continental United States, Puerto Rico, um, Guam, and there's a field office that covers every county. Some, some counties have, um, are combined with one field office, but you have representation everywhere. So in Massachusetts, for the folks in Franklin County, you have the Greenfield Field Office. And we do have two of the staff from the Greenfield Field Office today. We have Rose Swartz and Liz Herzik. If you could just put your hand up, stand up, turn around, just so folks can see you. <laughs> They've put their cards on the back table with some of the uh, information that we've brought along today for just general information about NRCS programs. But we wanted them here just so you can have a face. And please, by all means, contact them if you need assistance. So this next slide is rather busy, and it's kind of hard to see. But it's basically, it, it's a very broad overview of conservation assistance that we provide to farmers. And as Carolyn mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's that wide variety of agricultural producers. So it's, it's our dairy operations, it's our livestock operations, it's the veggie growers, it's the forestry folks that have big swaths of forest land, whether it be for just regular forestry practices or if you've got a sugaring operation, you're doing maple syrup, and then the small livestock operations. And then we've got the cranberries and the aquaculture. We've got our shellfish folks down in southeastern Mass. So there, you know, thinking about Massachusetts, we have a huge variety of agriculture. And we're here to be able to help all those different aspects and all those different types of production. You can always come to NRCS to ask for technical assistance and along that line you might fall in with becoming, you know, getting some financial assistance. But it all starts working with our sister agency, the Farm Services Agency, where you would establish yourself as a program participant as an agricultural producer. You'd get a farm number or a tract number. Many of you have already done that. But there's a lot of folks out there that don't understand that's where you start. And that's, that's where you start and you build your eligibility. That's where your eligibility is determined through USDA to establish you as an agricultural producer who would be eligible for USDA program benefits. So again, who are we? Natural Resources Conservation Service, we started out of the Dust Bowl days as a soil conservation service with Hugh Hammond Bennett. And we are the folks we, you know, considered the technical experts in anything that has to do with soil erosion, water quality, 
water, wa wind and water erosion. That's kind of where we got our foothold. So over time, you know, we do more than just soil. So that's when um, our name was changed from the Soil Conservation Service to the Natural Resources Conservation Service because we're looking at all those different things. Soil, water, air, plants, animals, humans, and now we're looking at you know, energy options too. So as I mentioned, NRCS provides conservation technical assistance and financial assistance. And those are just two different branches of what we do. The technical assistance side is us providing you, whether it be a handout, whether it be sending you information to go to a website and look for information, or you come in the office or we go out to see you and we talk and we talk through what is it that you're having a problem with? What do you see as a resource concern? And we can talk to you about that. As federal agents, everything we do for you is free. It's your tax dollars. Your tax dollars are paying our, our salaries. So when we come out to talk to you or we provide you with some kind of an assistance, it's free. So this just talks a little bit more about our conservation technical assistance. And it doesn't bind you to anything. It doesn't, you know, you're not signing anything to say that you're required to do anything. It's just us as those experts in the field, source, you know, whatever it could be, helping you to try to determine what's your next step forward. And then the financial assistance side, that's where we receive money from farm bill programs. And we have lots of different programs. The majority of our money probably goes out to agricultural producers to actually do good things on the land to help you, you know, implement conservation practices. Next slide, please. And this is Catherine. So um, my section of things is we look at the technical side and the resource concerns. And, um, Basically, with NRCS, we mostly service private landowners, and most of the land in the United States is privately owned. So what we're doing when we come out to look at your properties is we're looking for resource concerns. So something that is um, degrading uh, the ecosystem. And so, like Rita had mentioned before, we're gonna be looking at the soil, the water, the air, the plants, animals, um, humans and energy and seeing how we can help you um, and help the, the ecosystem. And um, just, we didn't mention before, but NRCS is a voluntary agency. We are not regulatory. So if we come out to your um, property, then that is, you know, it's not a regulatory thing. If you don't want our help, that's fine. We go away and, you know, you can contact us again when, um, when you're looking at assistance. But um, that's the first step, is having a planner, which we have two here, um, come out and, and look at your property with you and go over what is causing an issue. When uh, we, we go out and we assist you, we also um, are going to be working on what we call a conservation plan. So with that, we identify what resource concerns are on your property, and then we suggest some um, practices to help fix those resource concerns. And with that, we're gonna put together map, tons of maps, um, maps on your, your property, your conservation um, plan, on where we're going to be um, addressing those resource concerns. We are going to um, give you maybe topo maps, soil maps, um, location maps, just lots of maps. Um, and then you're gonna get you know, a conservation plan with that. It will tell you when we're suggesting you fulfill these practices, um, and then there will be, um, if you're going to apply for financial assistance, there will be some sort of a plan that tells you how much you might get from us. And so um, things that you might apply for are like, Mark gave some really good slides earlier that we were like, oh yes, we could so help those producers. So the, one, the slide where he was um, showing the cows in the stream, that's something that we can assist with. So we would come in, we would help um, put exclusion fencing um, so that the cows are no longer uh, going into the stream. The resource concern there would be water quality. And um, then we would provide the cows another water source. So um, we potentially pay for a well 
Uh, we could be paying for the water trough. Um, there maybe there's a heavy use area involved that we put with the water trough. Um, so there's a lot of different things. Maybe we'd be playing for a prescribed grazing system or reseeding, or there's so many things that we could assist with. Um, and um, those would be, you know, helping with all these different resource concerns, as we call them. And then um, the other slide that Mark had where he was showing um, how the, the erosion on the stream that was coming um, in and removing the farmer's land, that's something that we can assist with too, more than just a riparian buffer. Maybe we come through and we help with um, stream bank stabilization. Maybe we put some log jams in. Maybe we put, um, uh, you know, rock toe and, you know, smooth out the stream a little bit and then put in a buffer. There's a lot of things that we can assist with there. Um, and so these are options that we would go over with you when we're talking about the conservation plan. Like, this is what we suggest, but we're voluntary, right? So let us know. This is a working relationship. And so we want to help you help the land is kind of our purpose here um, with NRCS. So one of the, um, probably the program that most of the ag producers know about is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which is EQIP. And Carolyn mentioned, you know, money. So we were level funded this year on our EQIP Classic dollars. And that's just because we don't have a new farm bill. We're still running on the 2018 farm bill. We did not get a new farm bill yet. So it's been extended one more year. That being said, we were level funded. So our classic um, EQIP funds were $5.8 million. But I'll make mention of it here down the road in a few more slides, that we do have additional dollars, and it's through the Inflation Reduction Act money, which is um, IRA funds, which was you know, voted in by the Biden administration to pro provide millions of more dollars and in, in a var variety of sectors across the United States. We did receive um, in IRA equipped dollars an additional $9 million. So we've got a lot of money, and it's looking at the things like Steve mentioned with climate smart ag and forestry practices. So those are the types of practices that are looking at soil health. They're looking at forestry practices. They're looking at grazing practices, looking at a lot of energy practices. There's a lot of opportunity for energy practice and energy improvements. Um, you know, sugaring operations, looking at you know, ROs or looking at steam aways, looking at better equipment, things like that. Looking at greenhouse operations where maybe switching out fans or switching out heaters, switching up irrigation systems. There's a lot of money available and you know, it's hard to keep saying the same thing over and over. Like we've got this money, we've got this money, we wanna spend it and not getting any interest. So I'm just getting the word out there. We've got a lot of money that we want to spend because we don't want to send it back, right? You send it back, they're going to look at Massachusetts and say, well, Massachusetts doesn't really need any money, so we're not going to give you any, you know, or as much. We don't want that to happen. We want to keep getting money, and we're going to keep getting more money, uh, at least for the next five years through the Inflation Reduction Act dollars. So part of EQIP, we also have a few water quality programs that are a little bit less known, and those ones actually are um, run out of the resources shop. So uh, one of them is um, NWQI, and this is um, for the National Water Quality Initiative. And these, we actually have four projects in uh, Massachusetts right now for that. And that is a relationship where NRCS, we talk to our partners and we see where are um, some watersheds that are really degraded and um, what can we do to help those watersheds. So we, we work with our partners, we identify these watersheds, and then we have um, a partner write us a watershed plan. And so that would be, um, so right now we have two um, of our four NWQIs that are in the planning stage where we're getting that plan written. And then once that plan is written, then it moves on to the implementation stage. And that is where we are able to um, come and to national and say, hey, we have this plan 
written by a partner, um, that tells us how we can work together to improve water quality in this watershed. And then at that point, we say, this is how much money we need from you, national office, um, to implement this plan. And, um, and then they can uh, give us an allocation uh, for that implementation of the plan. So right now, um, Uncady Brook and Westport are in that implementation stage where we are getting money from our national office um, to implement the plans. And then um, in Franklin County, we have one that just finished up in the South River. And so that is, we just got the plan from Franklin County, which was our partner agency uh, that uh, wrote the plan for us. And so we will be applying for implementation dollars starting the next fiscal year to help implement that plan. Now to say, we also have these, this equip money and all these other programs, so you know the customer could get funded in that um, the NWQI money, or they could also apply to one of Equip General or IRA or you know some of, some of our other programs to get um, help in that watershed. But that's a really wonderful program and happening in your county. Catherine, yeah. can, yep. you, can you perhaps explain any practical? benefits of that to a farmer? I mean, that type of program, it's got a great name, but what does it mean on a daily basis? Yeah, so um, in the South River, you have, um, that river is having an impaired watershed, and we have identified that some of that is due to agriculture um, based on the plan. And so some of the items that we are going to be put into the implementation um, for next year would be exclusion fencing for cattle and um, riparian buffers and um, putting uh, nutrient management plans together for farms so that they know how much manure to spread, where to spread it, when to spread it. Um, and so these are some of the practices that we will be have asking national, the national office to give us even more money to help with Franklin County uh, producers. There's gonna be others, but those are just kind of the, the main ones that are, um, that are identified in the plan. So the plan is wonderful. Thank you, Franklin County. It's actually one of the best plans I've received um, since I started this. It is the best plan that I've received since I started this position. So they did a really, really nice job. It was for Cog. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then we also have source water protection areas. And so these are areas that are impaired water, um, impaired watersheds, but this is for drinking water. So this is a little bit different. The um, NWQI can be for any type of um, impaired watersheds, but source water is just for drinking water, the drinking waters that are impaired. impaired. So, that is um, a map of where we have these source water protection areas, and we haven't really got into um, the cost share rates with NRCS, but I'll talk briefly about that now. If you are just a general producer and you are applying for financial assistance with us, our regional office decides about how much it should cost for you to implement a, implement a practice, and then a general producer would receive 75% of that cost that they are saying that it would, it would cost to um, implement the practice. And if you are um, a producer that is um, you know, maybe a beginning farmer, uh, which means that you have been farming less than 10 years, or um, if you are limited resources, um, or some other uh, different historically underserved groups, then you would could potentially receive 90% cost share rate. But if you are in a source water protection area, you also receive 90% cost share rate for anything that would improve water quality, any practices that we do would improve water quality. So um, it wouldn't matter if you've been farming you know, 50 years on your property, you could still get that 90% cost share rate. So that's something special about um, source water protection areas. And um, Franklin County is um, in one of the source water protection areas. So if you're doing practices for water quality, you might be able to be considered um, for that 90% cost share rate. And you also might even have a better chance of getting money if you are in the, um, the South River watershed, so. 
Uh, so conservation stewardship program. This program is really geared toward those producers that have been working with NRCS or maybe they've been working with other agencies, maybe they've been working with MDAR, maybe they've been working with their forester, but they are the folks that have been doing a lot of good work. They're good stewards of the land. They've been doing cover crops, you know, for 20 years. And this program is really geared toward rewarding those producers. So it's, it gives a financial incentive to continue to do those good practices, but maybe do something a little better. Maybe you've been doing cover crop with just a straight rye, you know, for the last 10 years. This could give you an incentive to try to do something ma with maybe a cocktail. Maybe add another, you know, species. Maybe throw in a little bit of clover. Maybe throw in, you know, something else into that mix. So it's a program that's really geared toward rewarding you for the good work that you're already doing. And as, um, as of this fiscal year, as of October of 2023, we're in fiscal year 2024, um, there's a minimum payment of $4,000 a year. These contracts are five-year contracts. So at a minimum, that's paying $4,000 a year over five years. You've got a minimum of $20,000 in this program. Really good program. Um, something to think about, you know, something, something that if you're doing a lot of work, like you're doing a little bit of thinning in your, in your sugar lot, and you're doing it on your own. You know what? That's a little money that could help pay your taxes and buy some more gas and oil for your chainsaw. You know, those are the types of things that um, take, take into consideration. It's, it's a good program, and we've got a, quite a bit of money for that. The next slide talks about the um, Agricultural Management Assistance Program. This program um, is only available in 16 states across the country. Massachusetts is one of those states. And it's um, really geared toward the states that have not historically taken advantage of disaster payments over the years. Now, we know that that's changed because of climate change and such, but that program still only targets 16 states across the nation. A lot of the states in the Northeast are, um, are, have availability to um, be included in this program. We don't get a lot of money out of this program, um, but we try to utilize it for mostly high tunnels and new irrigation because the new irrigation takes away that threat of not having any irrigation and um, revising an irrigation system that's already in existence. We have more of a tendency, we will try to do funding through that through the EQIP program. Another program that I administer is the Agriculture Conservation Easement Program, and that's two different programs, really. It's the Agriculture Land Easement Program, and we partner often with MDAR's APR program. And I don't think folks realize Massachusetts NRCS has partnered with MDAR's APR program for the last 30 years, and we provide 50% of the fair market value of that easement for their APRs. Now, most people don't realize that, and that's why I'm always like pushing, saying, hey, you guys, you ought to mention that NRCS is paying 50% of that, but whatever, so I'm telling you now. So we're also really trying to engage land trusts because this is an opportunity for land trusts. You don't, you don't have to go through APR, you can go directly through the ALE program, you can directly come to NRCS if land trusts are trying to work with a landowner to protect their land. And that's really geared toward active farmland. So you've got a lot of land here in the valley that NRCS has partnered with MDAR on for these APRs. And we are also, um, we contributed 50% of that money that you know helped pay you for those. The other program is the Wetland Reserve Easement Program. And we don't have a lot of um, activity here in Western Mass or even in really most of the state of Massachusetts. That program really works well down in Cranberry land. It really works well for those cranberry producers that have a bog that's probably been in production for 100 years and it's just running out. But 
they're really putting all their efforts into these other bogs that they've replanted, they put a lot of infrastructure and whatnot. This program could come in, it could pay for an easement on that retired bog. It's taking that bog out of production. You get to keep the land. We're paying you for an easement to keep it as quiet enjoyment. You can't farm it. And then we will come in and pay for the restoration of that. You know, and we're looking, honestly, we're looking at like the last few years, we've been paying $13,600, $13,500 an acre for some of these bots. And you know, you're talking 30, 40 acres, right? Taking a little bit of upland, um, include the restoration of taking out all the dikes, ripping out all the irrigation that was in there, um, tearing out the water control structures for those bypass channels. You know, you're, you're looking at contracts with, directly with these producers at, you know, $1.3 million, $1.4 million. Great program. Um, we've only really done two of these projects in Western Mass. We did one down in Blanford with Leon Ripley. He still got that project. We still, um, it, it was a hay field that um, it was drained. Beavers came in, he just could not, he could not beat out the beavers, so he put it under a WRE. And then I did another one up in Northfield on a field that was, um, it had been drained, but it was wet and they just, the landowners, you know, they weren't farmers really. They had people use their land and they really liked the natural habitat. So we did like potholes. They were almost like little prairie potholes on this piece of property. And so the land is still theirs. They were paid for the easement, so they got money in their pocket and we paid for the restoration. It, it's, it's, you know, it fits in some areas. Um, it doesn't really fit that great for around here because we want to keep maintaining that drainage, right? We don't want it to go back to wetland here in this part of the state. And we know that, so we don't, we don't beat people up trying to get you interested in that program. That's really, really works well down in Cranberry land. I'm, I just mentioned, you know, briefly before Inflation Reduction Act dollars, it's really looking at, you know, financial assistance to provide for climate smart agriculture and forestry practices. There's some practices there on the screen, you know, it mentions like the cover crops and the soil health practices, looking at energy practices to reduce that carbon footprint. Well, you know, again, more money, it's the big, you know, tick word right now looking at, you know, climate smart ag. And then this is just like, you know, with all these programs, we have to have rankings and we have to have announcements and we tell you when it's, you know, hey, get your applications in now and we'll consider your application that makes it in by this date. And if you didn't make that date, you know, you didn't get your application in by that date, well, you have additional dates. So we just tried to kind of, it's a little busy here, I know, but different dates. CSP, we've already had one round of applications. We've got another one coming up in March. EQIP, you know, um, AMA, oh, some of the uh, RCPP, that's, you know, we've got some RCPP projects, regional conservation partnership programs. They kind of, it's really having like um, Massachusetts Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, Patrick Conlon is a forester with them, and he's out getting projects and bringing those projects to us, and we're funding them through that. And then the NWQI. So there's a bunch of different rounds. We've already had our initial application deadline for the easement programs, because that really takes a long time. You're talking deeds, you're talking easements, and you're talking forever. So that, that really takes a lot more time. Um, and and then just some of the other RCPPs that we have some different dates on. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about um, wetland compliance and our portion of um, wetland compliance. So this is only for customers of USDA. And as I mentioned, we are not a regulatory agency. So this is just, if you wanna work with us, these are some of the things um, that, uh, that we'll talk about as far as wetland compliance. NRCS 
plays a role in wetland compliance in that we have to make sure that the producers that we work with are not um, converting wetlands. Uh, more than 50% of the wetlands in the U.S. have been converted uh, since the 1700s, and that is why um, the federal government has put together um, a few regulations. And a lot of that was due to agricultural development in the past. So the big three um, regulations that we look at with NRCS is the Clean Water Act of 1972, and that regulates uh, pollutants entering the waters of the U.S. Uh, we look at Executive Order 11990, and that is specifically for NRCS, and that states that NRCS cannot further contribute um, to the degradation of a wetland. We have something called environmental evaluation, uh, CPA 52, and we have to fill that out for every single project that we play any sort of technical or financial assistance in. And um, that has to do with Executive Order 11992. And this is where we will evaluate if we are going to be degrading any wetlands. And then we have the Food Security Act, which is also called Swamp Buster, and that um, denies USDA program benefits um, to any producers that potentially converted, uh, you know, a wetland for agricultural uh, use and or further degraded a wetland. And that is where we will go out and delineate wetlands if there's, um, if they haven't been delineated before with new customers. So when a new customer comes to us or Farm Service Agency, uh, there is an eligibility paperwork um, document that is called the AD 1026. And this is actually a Farm Service Agency document, but it sends us a notice basically that we need to go out and delineate a wetland or look to see if there's any wetlands um, on a property if it's a new producer. So every time that um, you sign up for our assistance, you will have to fill out this 1026 as part of eligibility paperwork and it's just let, letting us have the authority to go and look to see if there are wetlands on your property. And it's also for highly erodible lands as well. So that's another thing, but we're not gonna really go into that. On that 1026, it asks about agricultural commodity. And that is any crop that's planted or produced by annual tilling of the soil, including um, one trip planters or sugarcane. So we're looking at, is an agricultural commodity planted on your property? And some examples of that could be corn silage, small grains, annual vegetables. Some things that are not agricultural commodities would be Christmas trees, blueberries, or orchards. So we are now seeing, saying, okay, so you have an agricultural commodity on your property. Are you doing anything to make um, production possible in a wetland situation. So that would be then saying that you are converting a wetland basically. <coughs> so that would be um, if you are making your wetland farmable. So that could be if you're draining the wetland, if you are putting a ditch right next to a wetland, um, even if it's not through it but is now draining the wetland, that would be um, considered making pro production possible. If you're putting drain tile, in a field um, or that normally is a wetland, that would be making production possible. If you um, are removing vegetation from a wetland that now is making it possible for you to drive a tractor through that wetland and plant it, that would be making production possible. Um, so those are things that we're looking at when we're filling out, when we're evaluating those 1026 documents. So I kind of already went through some of these manipulation examples, but um, also uh, dams, if you're putting in a dam, if you're putting in pumps or ter uh, terraces, um, all these would be something that we would look at. And so if you're thinking about doing some of these activities, like maybe you have you know, an area on the side of your field that you, it's a little bit wet, but you're thinking, oh, let me clear that, then I could expand my field. That's when you want to get us involved first if you're already a customer with us and say, hey, I'm thinking about clearing this, this part of my property. Can you come out and just evaluate, make sure it's not a wetland and we're good? 
Um, and we would rather you do that at the front end than coming out to like, maybe we're going out to certify that you planted some cover crop and then we see that you have cleared a potential wet area on the side. Then we're gonna be like, oh, you know, we need to do a 1026, you have you refill at the 1026 for that area on the side of your um, property because we can't, we can't be in a contract with someone who potentially converted a wetland. So we wouldn't be able to like pay on the cover crop until we figure out if you did convert a wetland. Um, and then it just gets a little murky. So just call us before you do anything like that. <laughs> and then we'll be, all, we'll be all good. And also we cannot report, right? We're not regulatory. So if we come out and we see something a little sketchy, we don't say anything. We'll tell you. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to do that, yeah. or you need to fix that. But we we cannot report you. Yeah. I, I just want to say uh, my experience with NRCS has been so outstanding. They hold your hand through the permitting process on so many complicated things, and so I, I really feel that we can trust them as partners. They're really there to help, and and that is so clear. So clear. Thank you for that. That's how we, we want to help. We, that's why we're in this. We love our jobs and, um, and really feel passionate about what we do helping farmers help the land. Uh, so these are just some examples um, that we've already kind of gone over, but um, tree cutting with stump removal um, of that, you know, in between those two fields and now it's you know a fully you can drive the tractor right through there you could plant corn you can do whatever that is something that we'd be like okay that needs to be evaluated and so before you clear that just call us up we'll have a wetland determination made and let you know okay not a wetland go ahead or oh that is a wetland you shouldn't you know touch that and um, here's the hydro hydrologic manipulation so um, you have a field then you put a ditch through it now it's no longer wet you can see in the photo on the left that it's dark it's wet photo on the right it's being drained now so that would be also a situation where you are further degrading a wetland and so that would be probably in this situation a violation we wouldn't be able to work with that customer again until they restored the wetland and so that's something that we will work with you on. Like we can help you put a plan together. We can tell you what to do to get back into compliance with USDA. So it's not like we're, we'll never go work with you again. Like we'll show you, we'll, we'll hold your hand through it, you know, and, and make sure that you understand um, what needs to be done. But again, contact us before you do that. And then there's, there won't be a um, need to uh, do a restoration plan. And that's uh, Rita and my contact information. Our email is the best way to get in contact with us. And we're here to help. So if you need anything, please email us away. OK. What I'd like to do now is just introduce um, Michael Leff from the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Districts. Um, but I'd like to say uh, Massachusetts is really punching above its weight uh, nationally now. Um, Kim LaFleur is the first woman and from the Northeast who is president of the National Association of Conservation Districts. And um, I've hung in there enough on national committees that I now sit on the National Resource Conservation um, Committee uh, for NR NACD. And it, it's really important to understand that we're accessing money. For, to, to go to you all, and we really want you to participate. So please, please reach out. Um, and so I'm turning it over to Michael Left, who is our um, executive director of the Mass um, Association of Conservation Districts, which I, ch which I am president of uh, currently. And these are resources, um, Michael and Megan, that you can reach out. We have websites, you can now see their faces so you can reach out and they will help you. So Michael? Thanks, Carolyn. So I'm Michael Leff and uh, prior to becoming the director of the State Association of Conservation Districts, my main uh, partner that I was working with was the Franklin Conservation District and I, I live in Chesterfield, the second house over the Goshen line, so I'm practically in Franklin County. Um, 
are the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Districts is connected to and has a role in like everything that's been mentioned so far. Our primary agreement is with NRCS. That's kind of a requirement. And one of the main things we do for that is provide MACD staff to serve as program assistants in the NRCS field offices, including the one in Greenfield. And they are there to help folks who come in um, go get into those programs that, that Rita and Catherine were describing. Um, you know, shepherding applicants, helping with the paperwork, eligibility, all of that. So that is one of the things MACD does. We also have a couple other staffers who help with the uh, easement program Rita mentioned and also with forest management. Um, so that's one biggie. In addition, just as the State Association of Conservation Districts, you know, that in that role, our purpose is to serve as a connector and communication and coordination and collaboration and support across all the districts. Um, and I'll come back to that, and Megan can tell you a little more about that as well. In addition, we also have a team of consultants that are out there doing work uh, for under grants from DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, helping producers get best management practices installed for the purpose of protecting water quality, but also for helping the farm stay economically viable. Um, and that's been going on in Western Massachusetts now, so some of you may already have come into contact with that team. Um, otherwise, you know, get in touch with me and we can help make those connections. Also, the MDAR, Department of Agricultural uh, Resources, we have a team out there that is doing monitoring on the APR, the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Properties. And did you know that NRCS pays 50% of MDAR's program? <laughs> I just thought I would mention that Thank little you, sir. fact. Um, oh, and also, we are the ones who are overseeing the National Water Quality um, Initiative in the Manhan River, one of the ones that Catherine was mentioning. In fact, I'll be going from here to an update on what's going on with that one. And then, so just lastly, um, you know, we are kind of like a clearinghouse, a source of connections and communications. Um, we have a very active website that includes information on funding opportunities, events, various resources, news, job opportunities, and a newsletter that we send out monthly that connects with the uh, website. So I would encourage you to sign up, you know, get, get on our list so we can stay in uh, contact. And for all of these things, you know, I am probably not the one who has the expertise, but a lot of my friends and colleagues do. I know how to get answers. So I uh, encourage anyone to please be in touch. That's me. Megan. So everything that he just said, except that um, we are your local conservation district. A lot of people that I meet don't know that they have a conservation district, and we're really fortunate in Western Mass. We have very active districts in Berkshire County, in Franklin, and in Hamden, Hampshire County, which merged a few years back. Worcester is also very active, but we, um, we do a lot of partnering together. Uh, as districts and also with other conservation organizations locally. We, we also work in concert with NRCS to help facilitate um, landowner and producer interactions with NRCS and access to programs. So we have staff that are specifically um, employed for that purpose. Uh, we um, are completely grant supported and right now we are running a program um, we have sort of a two-pronged outreach approach. One is producers, landowners, large, larger parcels of landowners, and then the other part is public education outreach. So um, we have a grant program running right now through the State Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs that is um, targeted at educating people about native plants and the really kind of um, dynamo that they are on the landscape for resiliency in in particular, um, they have incredible root systems that help really knit the soil together, make it more absorbent for water, which I know is a key for a lot of people who are dealing with water issues. We've been talking about that a lot today, um, as well as establishing really great um, 
proper nutrition for our pollinators who are really struggling these days. So we have a um, series of workshops that we work with the public libraries to put on, and those are happening through this winter. Uh, Michael and I doubled up our paper today, so Michael's uh, info is on one side, and the Franklin Conservation Districts is on the other. And on this page is the list of workshops that are happening in Franklin County this season. We are really, really fortunate in that we have a dearth of native plant experts in this county. Um, it's probably in part due to the Conway School of Landscape Design. Um, they've been doing a good job with their graduate program over the past several years to educate their students. And we have um, native plant farms here in Franklin County as well that are all part of that. So in getting all this money that you've been hearing about this morning um, out the door to residents, landowners, and these local businesses. We're working very closely with them to support people in accessing uh, native plants, the, the information about how to incorporate them into your landscape, whatever that landscape may be. And we're also partnering with towns. Deerfield was the first town that we partnered with um, to convert some municipal spaces. So uh, we started with a dry field out in, what's the road that it's on? Upper Road. On Upper Road. Um, it was a a meadow initially, I think, but um, it had, you know, invasives don't sleep, it seems. So um, it was starting to get encroached upon by some invasive species, and so we're returning that. We're doing some meadow restoration in that space. Um, we also have some partnerships going on with Leiden, and, um, and Conway's on the docket, and also Charlemont. Um, we have a project going on. So we're partnering with town properties and also offering the educational outreach to residents so you can um, so you can implement that in your own space regardless of how big or whatever purpose it has um, so i encourage you to pick up our flyer we've got that uh, should is there a spot that people are leaving yeah. things in the back table okay great so we'll put we'll put those back here in just a second and as michael mentioned we also welcome you to sign up for our email communications um, this is the main, main way to get uh, news from us, is just to leave us your name and email address, and we'll be able to send you any announcements of opportunities like this, which we often partner with um, other organizations to put on, as well as events at our local libraries, which um, are, are going on continually, so. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions of Megan or Michael? Okay. I would uh, like to add one thing. Oh, sure. We're run by a volunteer board. And we would welcome new participation. We, we really um, value a, a diverse background, life experiences, perspectives, priorities. Um, and we could always use new members. It's a, it's a monthly meeting. And it's usually a good time. And we do some really important work, considering that the board is volunteer and that I am 10 hours a week. We do a lot of good things. <laughs> so, so please come and visit us at one of our meetings. Um. Right now, uh, Wayne uh, is from our, that helps with our um, MVP um, committee, is going to just ask a couple questions as part of our MVP process, um, so we have a better handle on how we may help you in the past, in the future, in the future, right now and the future, um, as a, as a municipality. So, and I will be less than five minutes here. I'll be out of here at noon. So we're passing out just a brief list to everybody. So the, the town, as you heard, is preparing this MVP planning process. And as part of that, the state asked the town to say, what are the areas, what are the resilience challenges for the next decade? Um, and so I just want to go over what the core committee has identified as the resilience challenges that affect farmers and large property owners. And it's important because we want to make sure we get those on the list we send to the state because that helps make the town eligible for hundreds of thousands of dollars of future grants. Um, so I'm just going to read through this quick. We, we think we have everything, but please, if I'm missing something, it's really important to get because if two years from now the town wants to apply for a grant to help farmers and large landowners, we'd like to identify those. So obviously, generally, climate change stress um, is an issue, but we're interested in changes that are both due to climate change and natural hazards that you may have faced 50 years ago. So, you know, resilience challenges are not just about climate change. So the list that we have is obviously flooding, particularly for small creeks. You know, the Connecticut River may change less than all the small rivers in town. Second one is frost damage. Third is obviously drought, probably particularly for people of unirrigated fields, but others in general, um, erosion, 
heat for both farm operations and for farm workers, extreme heat. Um, and then the, one of the biggest ones is just the unpredictability, that you know, it's hard in the spring to figure out what to plant when you don't know what the, the weather will be. Um, uh, damage, obviously, to farm road culverts and farm roads from, from flooding. Uh, and then finally, damage to town roads that prevent you from getting out of the farm to sell products or deliver products. Are we missing anything? I think, I think that um, extreme cold increased snow loads. You know, we don't usually get like just a few inches. We have a tendency in the hills to get, you know, two feet in March, and it's heavy. Puts a lot of, you know, yeah. puts a lot of strain on structures, livestock operations, the, the orchard folks. Is the reverse also true, the lack of snow and then frost goes deeper? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Great, thank you. And just the radical fluctuations from one to the other, suddenly it's really warm, growing things start to do their thing, then all of a sudden it gets yeah. shut down. That happened last winter. Great, okay, thank you. Other ones? I don't come from an agricultural background, but one thing I would think about would be expansion of invasive species as the weather changes, things are moving on. Yeah, very good. Yeah. That might, <clears throat> might include uh, insects and other uh, rodents. Okay, so both plants and pests. Okay. Yep, okay. Thank you. Other ones from you all, weather panel? Great, okay. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Um, I just also want to just mention publicly again um, it, it's almost unheard of that DEP was wonderful working with us as partners in the, our damage was so unprecedented that we just couldn't deal with the 30-day emergency deadline, and DEP um, gave us an extension not once, not twice, but three times, and that was pretty unheard of. Um, so I just want to say thank you publicly again to DEP. I mean, I have emailed you to say thank you, but it really, uh, un unbelievably good partners uh, in this, uh, emergency uh, events that we had in July, July 10th, which was most of the crop damage, and mentioned that it was Deerfield River. Then July 16th, which, which was a rainstorm, but then the 21st was wiped out some of our um, repair work, um, and that was mo much more extensive for us as a town. I mean, just millions and millions of dollars worth of damage. So it, I, we just couldn't even get contractors to, to respond in that time frame. So it was amazing. And I just can't emphasize enough, the whole point of today was to show that we are really, you know, trying to be there for you, and, and we're all partners to help. And we really do have unprecedented damage this year, hopefully not in 2024, but we also have unprecedented opportunity. This is a once in a lifetime money that's coming into Massachusetts and everybody is working really hard to make that happen. And we really want you to take advantage of it. So, you know, reach out to anybody. You now see faces connected to the emails and the phone numbers. So please don't hesitate. No question is uh, not something that we can't try to find out. If we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll help you get the answer. So please, please call, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm really excited. I think this will have some impact on us in the long run. So thank you again. Thank you, Carol. Thank you.